tonight we're going to do something a little bit strange. All right, now, let me present what we're going to cover, and it's going to take us, I think, two talks to cover it. In the Platonic tradition, the highest notion is the good or the one. Now, how do you get <laughs> beauty and the role and the nature of love in such a discussion? Well, Plotinus really has a great insight into the subject. And it's not often discussed, so naturally enough, that would be a great subject for us to explore. So let me just quickly tell you where we're going in general first. This idea of the good or the one is the ultimate expression <clears throat> sometimes deified by the word God. Now, this idea of the good or the one is not sterile. It is an overflowing of limitless power. So, in this overflowing of this limitless power, and the return of that power, <clears throat> is the nature of the intelligence. And I'm just going to see if we can make that clear. Right. So the, wood, the, the one or the good, through its limitless power, as it were, this is the metaphors they use, overflows and returns to itself. Notice then, at the return to itself, there must be then, at that moment, a recognition. There must be a recognition of the return. In that recognition of a return, it must equally have recognized that that was the goal of the entire procession and return. So at that moment, you see, you can talk about three ideas. You can talk about recognition. You can talk about what it's like to recognize the goal or the source of one's nature. And therefore, if you have a recognition that's a goal that returns you to the source of your own uh, nature, then in recognizing that, you recognize in that fine sense the justification of the whole transmission and return. Now, what does that mean? That means, therefore, in returning in the recognition, one recognizes one has returned. That is the idea of being. Insofar as it is a recognition, that means it must be operable at that point, intelligence. The fact that it's aware of this vast return, that is, that, is that, that expression of this, is vitality. Now, what that means, therefore, that using this metaphor of overflowing, we have the idea of the one, or the good, same idea, overflowing, returning to its source, and therefore at that junction, that moment of recognition, 
They gave birth to being, intelligence, vitality. Now, in the very same way, intelligence being full, because by returning it completes itself, it too overflows and, as it were, returns. The same dynamic repeats itself. Well, then in this return, you see, <clears throat> we have then the same dynamic taking place on two levels. That means then that there is some, some life, it recognizes the life of its vitality, it recognizes therefore that there is a uh, reason for its return, one recognizes therefore that one has encountered the source of one's being or uh, existence. Put those three together, and that's the word for soul. Now, the thing that I want to focus on is usually people explore this idea of soul and intelligence, or the one. What we're going to do is just touch on this, but we want to see what are the terms and what is the way Plotinus talks about the soul returning not just to its own source, right, but to intelligence, and from intelligence, the return to the ultimate reality. When he describes that passage, that means, therefore, there's a part of the soul that is capable, that is capable of making that journey and in seeing, encountering, on two levels. Well, what kinds of terms best describe that? Now, what he does is say that the images, the images, the experience of love can best express that return. Now, what kind of love? He's talking about, while talking about that, he uses again and again romantic love between male and female. Then, he takes the dynamics of this kind of love and then talks about the same dynamics operating on a higher level but using the same language until finally it returns to the source, the one, the good. Let me go back and say it in another way. In his metaphysics, to try to explain this entire process, he uses romantic love. He then talks about that same kind of romantic love to talk about the way in which the soul encounters being, intelligence, and vitality. Then he talks ab about it again, especially in its relationship between these two. Or let me put it in another way, metaphorically, you see. It is as if, in the language he uses, the one becomes and the being, or we can call it intelligence, becomes equivalent to the masculine and feminine. When the soul relates to the intelligence, intelligence then takes on the aspect of the masculine, this time, and the soul, the feminine. What's interesting about this <clears throat> is that by doing this, he describes the nature of love in actually its most pure terms. <clears throat> in its, I would argue, perhaps, in its purest terms. 
Therefore, what happens in this exploration is that you're brought to see this kind of love most purely, and therefore through that very way of expressing it, you get a deep insight into the nature of love romantically, and you also see how it functions metaphysically and psychologically. And it begins to be, therefore, the language and the key terms for understanding this return of intelligence back to the one. That's where we're going. Now, to do that, it'll take a little, take a little while, of course. To do that, we have to talk about this and this as purely as we can as well as the idea <clears throat> of soul. Now, I want to stay here for a moment. So being, intelligence, vitality, they're rather abstract terms. So I'd like to move it out of that realm and put another word on it. This being, intelligence, vitality, when it experienced, when experienced, it is, it is experienced in the terms a pure beauty, beauty itself. Pure beauty or beauty itself. The way in which it is encountered, sometimes they speak of that phenomenologically, the way in which it appears when experienced, is a divine radiance and luminosity, which, when experienced, is the experience of a very profound, blissful state. Now, what we have to see, therefore, is that when someone encounters this, we want to know two things. We want to know, why do these three terms fit that? And then we want to know something else. We want to know uh, something about this curious thing called Plato's forms. Plato's forms. Now, the three kinds of forms, the highest ones are called primary forms. And so we also want to get an idea of what this means. Now let me give you an example of a form. This won't be the primary form, it's an idea form. Whenever you see something, and in seeing it you recognize it belongs to a class of things just like that, you come to the conclusion there must be some cause for that similarity, that's a form. The example I would like to use is man. Generic man, right? mankind, man. When you see a member of that man, you recognize immediately, you can discount all the differences, and you can spot some essential quality that says, oh, that's a man. That's not anything like anything else. It's a man. So therefore, in this language, there is a there is a form of man. Now, that's not the primary forms. Now, I'd like to talk about that in a, in a short while so that we can bring in a little more vitality to it, bring a little more substance to it, and especially the way in which the soul relates to it. So, let me take that out now and go back to it later. Now, Consider this. Consider the fact that you are experiencing something like this. You're participating in it. You're in it. Is it not likely that you would be able to recognize in that experience that this is the source of beauty or of beautiful things. 
That is to say, you can see this as a wondrous beauty. And in that experience of the wondrous nature of beauty itself, recognize that everything else falls far short of that experience, so much so that it opens you up into a blissful state. Now, if you go along with this now one more step, you can say that in this experience, compared with everything else you experience that you take to be real, no matter what it may be, even uh, uh, anything that, has, that comes into existence, anything that comes into existence at all, chalk, dogs, people, anything, uh, movies, pictures, both what we would call both real and images of real things. Is it not likely, therefore, if you experience this idea of beauty, that you're going to recognize that there's, that in that experience, there is a heightened sense of reality to this, or it wouldn't have the effect it has, which is blues. So that in that experience, what you really see and catch a glimpse of is the nature of reality. You say, oh, that's really what reality is. That's really what reality is. Because everything else is just a, a vague copy of that reality. Another word for reality is the word being. Same word in Greek, same word. Now, take another one on. Suppose now you consider everything you've ever studied, everything you've ever reflected upon, all the jokes you've ever heard. And jokes are a very good example. Would you agree when you get a joke, you get an insight? So therefore, we have a good deal of experience with insights. When you understand anything, to whatever degree you understand it, you're seeing it as a unity. That's an insight. And it often is an occasion with, ha ha, right? wow, yeah, I see it. Oh, that makes sense. That's intelligible. Right? Now, if that's the case, suppose in this experience you recognize it has that same quality, that very same quality, that you recognize it with an instantaneous sense of, oh my gosh, that's real. That's an insight. That's an insight into the nature of reality as beauty. If that's the case, you see, if that's the case, then what you're recognizing in that experience, that there's something about that experience which is part and parcel, I mean, the very nature of it, runs through the whole thing is the presence of mindfulness, mind. Because that's what insights mean. And, I mean and one of the easiest ways to test whether or not someone uh, is capable of doing certain classes of work, you want to see if they have some native intelligence. Tell them a joke if they laugh. You know, they're pretty smart. Right? So with this, what is it you discover? You discover in that experience that it is not separate from mind or insight or intuition. Ah, intelligence. Therefore, in that pure experience of beauty itself, you encounter the nature of reality and you see it as more real than anything else you've ever encountered. Being. There's more mindfulness in that experience, most directly, not thoughts, but the very nature of insights and intuition, intelligence. Hey, you know what? When you're in it, you can't yawn. It's a full, it is a full experience where you are, in fact, drawn into it. You're wrapped up into it. You're experiencing it in the totality of, your, of the range in which you're capable of experiencing. And therefore, you recognize that through the whole thing, that this is a very alive experience. It's not dead. It's not light like that. 
vitality. Therefore, when we're going to use the word being or intelligence, you have to keep together all of this. That's what we mean by it. That's what Plotinus means by it. Now, for Plotinus, the big thing he wants to get an insight into is how the soul can be led to get from here. Draw a picture of the soul for you. All right. How the soul can get can be brought to an experience of this <clears throat> fully, directly. And once achieving it, once achieving it, using that, gaining an experience of the nature of ultimate reality, the nature of the good and the one. That's the goal. So what has he got? He's got, apart from describing each one of these, we then want to see how he talks about the process, the two processes. And we want to see, I want, we want to see something else. Remember we said what we want to see also in this is this curious doctrine of forms. Okay, now I'd like to hit that first for a moment. And luckily for you and I, I happen to have a sheet handy that I can use. No? Ah, put it on the wrong page. There we are, <clears throat> the primary forms. Now look here, you know what this means? Let's take a look at it. If it's possible to make the transition from recognizing the state of the soul to experience of bliss, if that's possible, then something that had a secondary existence is moved to a more primary existence. That is to say, there's been a process that went on that presupposes that presupposes a certain condition, and that is that you can become like this, that you can become like it. Mm, twice. Not only that, but you can become like that. Therefore, the condition for this, the necessary condition for this, if, if it wasn't possible for you to become like that, then it could never at all be possible. Therefore, <clears throat> this idea actually then ties us together. Therefore, the idea of likeness is the condition not only that allows the condition for participating on these two highest levels, but it also is that very notion that ties all together into a one. I should call it to be more correct, a unity. Or oneness would be better. <clears throat> now, those two ideas, those two ideas in Plotinus is the very definition for likeness. <clears throat> Therefore, Plotinus says, in order for this spiritual journey, this philosophy, to exist and function the way in which it does, there has to be something in the very nature of reality that allows it, that makes it possible. The condition for doing this must be that the idea of likeness must be built into the nature of reality form. 
Because a form is the condition for things to being the way they are on the most fundamental level. Therefore, that's a Platonic form. What is the idea of likeness? Now, <clears throat> when you made this trip from here to here, necessarily in that transition, you had to recognize that this was greater, or it wouldn't be worth the trip. You have to recognize that this transition from here to here gives you a preeminence, a sense of a greatness, experiencing a greatness. Now, this idea of a preeminence means, therefore, that when you achieve that, you know you have achieved a excellence. <clears throat> an excellence. And that through it, you had to strive to reach it. You had to strive to reach that and put all of your mind, energy, and force to achieve that divine vision. Oh, by the way, that which gives preeminence to the highest members in any class <clears throat> and the very cause of excellence and the striving to achieve excellence is the word greatness. Therefore, since this is possible, the condition for it is likeness and greatness. <clears throat> now look here. No one would be interested in that experience unless it had an overwhelming beauty to it. Because when we see something that's beautiful, we are attracted to it. The more beautiful, the more we're attracted to it. Therefore, this experience of beauty itself has a curious property. When you experience it, remember what we said, you recognize that that's the source of beauty and beautiful things, wherever it may appear. Therefore, it's said to be the source of symmetry, unity, the charm of perfection, it has a gleaming quality. It makes all things radiant. That's the word beauty. That's what beauty does. Therefore, the first three primary forms in Plato coming right out of this necessarily is likeness, greatness, and beauty. Now, look here. We need one more thing. In order to do this, there had to be something that had to be in place. And that is, you had to have the ability, the natural ability, to reflect on yourself. Because this whole passageway is reflecting on yourself. Learning to reflect on pure beauty. And finally, knowing how to contemplate the one. Now, this reflecting upon yourself, see, is that we have a particular faculty right, called the mind. Greeks have a better word for it, nous, dianoia. Dianoia. We have the capacity to reflect upon ourselves and strive to understand ourselves. That's a dianoia. If we also have the, this word we don't often use. It used to be used quite frequently, intellect. Intellect is that faculty that allows you to gain a divine insight. It's the highest use of the mind. Therefore, if you can get this higher activity functioning properly so that it can be focused on that, which is the vision, if you can get it to turn around, right, because you don't need anything, you have everything you need in this game. There's nothing you need. You've got it all. Just a matter of knowing where to look. Well, then, if you can get that part of the mind to work that way, and not go off on tangents, not spill off on tangents when you're interested in such a thing, then you're allowing each part to function the way it should, ideally. Oh, justice. Therefore, the condition for that experience is that there are functions within our psyche, soul, that is the capacity to reflect upon ourselves, and what does it do? It brings life and form to perfection. That's what it does, because then what do we do? 
we can then bring our life together, right? And we can bring to all kinds of things, whatever it is we're dealing with, we can bring this to perfection. If I'm interested in making something real good and I want to produce this, that capacity to direct my mind on that and make it as perfectly as possible, that's justice. That's justice. These are the four primary ideas called, in literature, Platonic forms. And all we're saying is, if you just take a look at that experience, the condition for that experience are these four ideas. Therefore, these four ideas must exist in some way independent of us, and we then can utilize them, or the condition for them, to bring about this type of experience. So these are the forms, the primary forms. I wanted to show you that these forms are just not arbitrary ideas, but they're necessary ideas because they are very, they are the very conditions for this pursuit. Now, if that's true, these four ideas are going to have to now be used in a certain way, with a certain vocabulary, to describe this process, one and two, and therefore, we're naturally going to be talking about the nature of love. Now, Plotinus uses two myths. I'd like to go through one now, and next week we'll go through the next one, which is the myth of Psyche, uh, Psyche and Aphrodite. Okay, this myth <clears throat> comes from Plato's Symposium. <clears throat> now, in Plato's Symposium, there is a speech by Diotima that Socrates recalls. Diotima was Socrates' teacher. She was a woman. He's the student. And much that we're going to talk about, and that Plotinus talks about, has its origin in what is really, if you use <clears throat> the Rouse translation of Plato's Symposium. The entire speech that Socrates recalls in the Symposium has 12 paragraphs. <clears throat> it has a splendid unity to it. The myth that he's going to use and Plotinus is going to use to explore this very problem is the very same myth that Socrates uses in the symposium in the third paragraph of Socrates' speech. Now, um, just to give you a quick summary of it, there was a banquet held in the heavens and all of the gods attended because they were celebrating the birth of Aphrodite. And Aphrodite, as you know, is the goddess of beauty, divine beauty, the birth of divine beauty. They're celebrating her birth. The birth of divine beauty is Aphrodite. And they held this vast banquet in the heavens. And poverty came in, and she stood by the doorway watching the frolicking around of the gods. She was not invited. So she stayed by the doorway watching. Soon, poverty saw plenty coming into the courtyard. Well, what it is is he was looking for a place to have a drink. And so he went into Zeus's park, sometimes called Zeus's gardens. And so 
He had his drink, as you can tell in this beautiful picture. And as it is, what happens sometimes? Sad to say, but it happens in the gods as well. There it is. It's passed out. What was left of the drink was spilled on the ground. <clears throat> poverty being broke had her eye on poverty, you see. And she said, now there's the time. Now this only happens in heaven. It's very difficult on earth. But she decided it was to be a great idea to seduce plenty. So she lied by his side and seduced him. And it's very difficult in our world, is it not, to seduce a man when he's passed out. But this can, happen in this can happen in the heavens. And so at that moment, with and in heaven, conception and delivery takes a short period of time. Along came love, birth of love came. And as a consequence of that, the birth of love, love then is now a follower and attendant of Aphrodite. Now, in this myth, poverty is described in great detail, a certain set of qualities. Plenty is described in a set of qualities. And therefore, as appropriate to the myth, we get descriptions of each of these. And that plays a major role in understanding Socrates' speech. But for our purposes, Plotinus says, you know, he says, you have to realize the significance of this. He said, that drink, which is called nectar, deathless, nectar, death, deathless drink, he passes out on it. That's a state of bliss. That's a state of bliss, passed out. And so the, the sexual union takes place, and love is born. But he's saying, look here, this defines the experience of this. Because <clears throat> one major reason is that poverty saw plenty and was, a, was strongly attracted to him. And as a result of that, she saw the need to, to join in union with him. And that kind of intimacy and breeding in what you find is beautiful is the very nature of this experience. Watch. To the degree that this is beautiful, to the degree that you encounter it, even a glimpse of it, would it not follow that you want to get in into it as fully as you can? In is a sexual term, right? In, intimacy, right? Therefore, in this experience, the person who has it wants to identify most fully with it. And if they depart from it for any reason, they want to get back to it as soon as they can because they are overcome by the experience of that divine kind of beauty. Now, love, therefore, is born. And notice the, the uh, gender changes. See, we would like to talk about the lover being the male. In this myth, the lover and the beloved this is a female, this is a male. They switched. And one of the problems in reading Plato is to discover why he wanted to do that. But love is a he. Now, in the experience of bliss in Plato's Symposium, we find a whole teaching about the nature of love and the nature of beauty. And it culminates in chapter and paragraph 10 and 11. In 10, there are actual steps, kind of a jnana yoga, that the individual, in this case Socrates, is being instructed in or described. So Diotima tells him the steps that you have to go through in order to gain this vision of beauty itself. In the 11th paragraph, there's a beautiful description of the nature of that experience. All right, a whole description of it. What's most interesting about this experience, you see, as described in the symposium, 
is after it is over, the individual then gives birth. His soul gives birth. That is, something comes out of that experience of vast consequences. And what is it? It is an excellence. And that excellence that is born out of this experience, same thing, this experience, the excellence that is born out of it has to be brought up, has to be brought up and nurtured. Which is to say, after this experience, a sense of excellence emerges and the person is therefore to that degree changed by that experience of excellence, because it's an experience of excellence. But that has to be brought up, nurtured, and developed. Because you've got another step to go. And the particular kind of excellence that's going to emerge from this type of experience must be cultivated. Must be cultivated, must be brought up, cultivated. And that's why you have two steps in here, one and two. Now, um, Zeus, by the way, in Greek thought, Zeus is the um, creator god. He's the one who, in Plato's time is, that creates the universe. Therefore, Zeus is, Zeus is often said to be representing divine intellect or divine intelligence. Therefore, since this event took place in Zeus's park or garden, it's the full development and growth and nurturing of the intellect. Because that's Zeus's garden, right? Zeus is the intellect, the full development and growth of the intellect takes place when in that situation where uh, plenty passes out on nectar, is seduced, uh, she becomes pregnant, gives birth to love. This is a divine encounter. Therefore, he becomes, love becomes a son of a god since plenty is a god. Now, what we have therefore in this model is an image of love, but it's not a romantic love. It's not a romantic love because she's unknown. He doesn't know her. There's no intimacy shared other than physical. There's no relationship maintained. Therefore, while this takes place as an example of love, Plotinus is going to take that image and raise it all the way up most profoundly. That's what we have to see, and that's where we're going. All right? Okay. Now, I brought together a bunch of things that will help us understand these ideas so we can then, so that we can then deal with this problem of the nature of love and beauty as a vehicle for reaching both the first and the second and the highest stage. So, what is this one? What does it do? Well, what are we talking about? After all, this is a Greek notion. We're not too familiar with it. It's not part of our culture, so we have to read about it. Even though it's part of a so-called Greek world, it doesn't play a role in our education. It might be an interesting education if it did, but it doesn't. All right, so just to keep a few things back here, we said this goes to here and then to there. Now, what can be said about the one? It is by the one that all beings are beings. Would you not agree anything that you consider, doesn't make any difference what it is, you're going to consider it as a unit, as a one. If you conceive of it, ah, the chalk, a piece of chalk, one chalk, ah, what do you know? Well then, this one has parts, but I conceive of it, and the way it is, is a one for as long as the parts remain together, 
To that degree, it remains a one. Once its parts disperse, it no longer has that unity and it falls apart and is wasted. Therefore, whether you're talking about a symphony, take a symphony, all right, a symphonic orchestra. The symphonic orchestra is a one, special kind of one, because all of the parts of a symphonic orchestra have a high degree of talent and training and education and nurturing. And then if we can match their skill with a great work, right, which I'd go for Beethoven's piano concerto right now, right, then you're bringing a oneness of, of a group of people brought together for a certain purpose. With all of their skills are brought together and excellence develops. They focus that excellence on a piece of intellectual work and produce a great orchestration for our satisfaction and for our enjoyment and perhaps to uh, bring us to a state of beauty. So, what about the soul? That's this curious. Now, the soul is a one. It's a one. But it's said to have three, par three parts, not physical parts, but distinctions. A reason, a reason, a spirited part, a spirited part, and an appetitive part, or a desire. Call it desire, it's simpler. Now, so long as those three stay together, then the soul functions. Right. And as a consequence of that, we then function with these three faculties and do what we do in life. Therefore, the soul makes each being one. Now, let's see what that means. Right? Now, there are two uses of the word soul. This individual soul, and also there's the idea that we just had a moment ago, and that isn't really individual soul. That's the idea of world soul. So there's another process that goes down here, just like the other, where we have individual souls taking over individual bodies. But I just would like to stay with this idea for a moment. Look, you see, soul then, we're talking about this. Soul then gazes upon the one, gazes upon the one. Ah, hey, the soul makes each living thing one by looking upon the one. Now, this is a different idea of evolution, you see, because uh, as it therefore looks upon the one, Right, then each, each particular being that the soul engages gains that particular capacity. Let's see if I can make sense of that for you. Right? Remember we said there are a bunch of other forms. One of the man. All right, so let's put man here as a form. Not primary form, but actually it's a third kind. Therefore, when the soul looks upon the one, it then has the capacity to grasp oneness. So it can make each living being a one by looking upon the one. And in so doing, it can then focus upon the image of man or the idea of man. And therefore, the particular beings that are living, living beings are here. When these living beings have reached the stage of maturity, then the soul, by looking at the one and grasping the form, can then make that form come into existence as man rather than an ape. So therefore, by contemplating man, man comes into existence. If there are any higher forms that must emerge, living forms to emerge, those living forms must be, in principle, resident in this realm. And when man or whatever species is ready for the next stage of evolution, then, by the same process, it will then move to the next species and will be either superseded or we will improve to such an degree that they won't need a new species. That's the idea of the soul operating within the range of ideas. So then, therefore, each being, any living, <clears throat> any living being, has a unity of its parts proportionate to its nature. The more profound its nature, 
the more organized and the more greater the unity that each particular thing has. Therefore, the unity is proportional to the nature of each thing. Now, it can bestow unity upon that particular thing called the man because one of the things the soul has is unity. This has unity, therefore it can bestow unity and to the degree that those parts stay together, the thing, particular thing is alive and continues to exist to the degree that that unity uh, disassembles, sickness and death take place. Now I want to move to the idea of being and intelligence and unity. <clears throat> Being possesses life and intelligence. We talked about that a moment ago, right? That highest experience reveals the nature of reality, and therefore what goes along with it is this other thing. It possesses life, vitality, and intelligence. Intelligence goes in three ways. As we said a moment ago, it itself seeks to return to its source. Seeks to return to its source. It re also reflects upon itself, and it can also reflect upon the things that participate in it. So it can have three functions. One, well, I'll put it hierarchically. One, two, and three. Therefore, that kind of intelligence functions in those three ways, and therefore brings unity to the entire cosmos. Now, this degree to which it moves up here towards the good or the one itself, the language that's used is that intelligence then approaches the one and it is in the presence of the one. Therefore, beauty is said to be at the threshold of the good. It's at the doorstep into it. It's the highest expression before the one or the good is experienced. Now, <clears throat> now, as soul approaches this, this, we need a couple of good quotes, don't we? Let me give you a nice couple of quotes for this. Plotinus is such a wonderful writer. And I think I have a couple of good quotes for him. Um, Okay. When the soul seeks to know in its own way, it does it by unification and coalescence. It is prevented by that very unification from recognizing it has found the one. For it's unable to distinguish the knower and the known. Nevertheless, a philosophical study of the one must follow this course. Because the soul see what because what the soul seeks is the one, and it would look upon the source of all reality, namely the good and the one, it must not withdraw from the primal realm and sink down to the lowest. Rather, one, it must withdraw from sense objects turn to those of the highest. It must free itself from all evil since it aspires to rise to the good. It must rise to the principle possessed within itself. From the multiplicity that was what, what it was once, it now returns to the one. Only thus can it contemplate the supreme principle, the one. Having become intelligence now, having entrusted itself to it, committed itself to it, having confined and established itself in it, so that by alert concentration the soul may grasp all the, all the intelligence sees, it will, by the intelligence, contemplate the one without employing the senses, without mingling perception with the activity of the, intent of the intelligence. It must contemplate this purest of objects through the purest of the intelligence through that which is supreme in the intelligence.
how to achieve difficulty is this. Awareness of the one comes to us neither by knowing nor by pure thought. It comes by a presence transcending knowledge. When the soul knows something, it loses its unity. It cannot remain simply one because knowledge implies discursive reason and discursive reasoning implies multiplicity. The one is present from nothing and from everything. It is present, however, only to those who are prepared for it, who are able to receive it, to enter into harmony with it, to grasp and to touch it by virtue of their likeness to it, by virtue of that inner power similar to and stemming from the one. When it is in that state in which it was when it originated from the one, thus will the one be seen as far as it can become an object of contemplation. Uh, uh, it's got an interesting, um, I'll, I'll skip it, I'll go back to it later. I want one more quote. Um, if the mind reels at this, the one being none of the things we mentioned, a start yet can be made from them to contemplate it. For do not let yourself be distracted by anything exterior. For the one is not in some place, depriving all the rest of its presence. It is present to all those who can touch it and absent only to those who cannot. Now, no man can concentrate on one thing by thinking of some other thing. So he should not connect something else with the subject he is thinking of if he wishes to grasp it. Similarly, it is impossible for a soul impressed with something else to conceive of the one as long as it has such an impression and it occupies its attention. Just as it's impossible that a soul at the moment when it is attentive to other things should receive the form of what is their contrary, So must the soul, for a stronger reason, be stripped of all forms if it would be filled and fired by that supreme without any hindrance from within itself, too. Having thus freed itself of all externals, the soul must turn inward, not allowing itself to be rest back towards the outer. It must forget everything, the subjective first and finally the objective. It must not even know that it is itself, that it is applying itself to the contemplation of the one. Four. After having dwelled with it sufficiently, the soul should, if it can, reveal to others this transcendent communion. This divinity, is said, is not outside any being, but on the contrary, it's present to all beings, though they may not know it. They are fugitives from the divine, or rather from themselves. What they turn from, they cannot reach. Themselves lost, they can find no other. Ah, by the way, the man who has learned to know himself will at the same time discover whence he comes. This is the example he gives. The one doesn't contain any difference. It's always present, and we're present to it when we no longer contain difference. The one does not aspire to us to move around us. We aspire to it, to move around it. Actually, we always move around it, but we don't know. We always look. We are like a chorus grouped about a conductor who allow their attention to be distracted by the audience. If, however, they were to turn towards their conductor, they would sing as they should and would really be one with them. We're always around the one. 
If we were not, we would dissolve and cease to exist. Yet our gaze does not remain fixed upon the one. I shouldn't start reading. <laughs> but I wanted to show you how he describes the process and how he uses this language. <clears throat> now, one other bunch of terms just to give you a background for it. <clears throat> a good part from what we just read, but just to make sure we're together with it. The awareness of the one comes by a presence, transcending knowledge. Why? Oh, out of choice. Oh, no. <clears throat> See, it must transcend knowledge because knowledge involves always three things. A knower, a process of knowing, and the object known. These are always different. The knower is different from the knowing, and it's different from the known. Therefore, if there were such a thing as knowledge of the one, it would be a tripart. But if there is no difference in the one, then you can't have a knowledge of it, because the knowledge of it presupposes a tripart division. Therefore, awareness of the one has to come by a presence transcending knowledge. Now, we can point out the way now, the example he uses is, uh, well, I'll, I'll do that in a minute. But light is not enough. The luminosity is not enough. We have to transcend. We have to go beyond it. We have to go beyond it. <clears throat> Therefore, you have to prepare for it. You have to be able to be willing to receive it. You have to enter into it. You have to grasp it. You have to touch it by likeness. It has to become your object of contemplation. See, what is contemplation? The, the reason why love is so important in this game is because those who know what this is know that that's the easiest way to contemplate. Right? If someone's in love, you don't have to say what's on your mind. It's a natural yoga. Therefore, the more this is perceived as beauty on the highest level, hey, you don't have to tell anybody to contemplate it. You have to tell them to stop. All right, now, this awareness of the one, then, has to become an object of contemplation because it's a natural object of contemplation. Once you see that it goes to beauty and beyond beauty and beyond it, therefore, Plotinus says, this one is a limitless power. Limitless power. Full limitless power. He calls it, it's like the activity of thinking. Same three-part now, right? There has to be a thinker, there's a thinking, and there's an object of the thought. But the activity of thinking, the activity of thinking, doesn't have any qualities. Let's try it again. Let's take, instead of thinking, let's take light. Would you agree that between myself, my eyes, and that wall, for me to see the wall, there has to be the presence of light. But light itself has to be invisible, or it would be blocking my vision of the wall. Therefore, light is invisible, though it makes the object luminous, allows us to see the object. But light itself is invisible. Right. Same thing here. He says that. Same thing here. Therefore, um, he wants to bring it together now, and that's what I'd like to do for you. Right. This last section, which I think is a very beautiful quote. It's often quoted by, uh, when people write about Plotinus. The flight of the lone to the alone. The alone is the one. The flight of the lone, you and I, alone. 
the flight of the alone, right? The flight of the alone to the alone is the very process of philosophy. So let me give you a couple of quotes from us so we can play. <clears throat> Only in the world beyond does the real object of our love exist. The only one with which we can unite ourselves, of which we can have a part, and of which we can intimately possess without being separated by the barrier of flesh. Now anyone who has had this experience will know what I'm talking about. He will know that the soul lives another life as it advances towards the one reaches it and shares in it. Thus restored, the soul recognizes the presence of the dispenser of the true life. It needs nothing more. On the contrary, it renounces everything else and rests in it alone, becomes it alone. All earthliness then is gone, eager to be free and patient with every fetter that binds itself below, in order so to embrace the real object of its love with its entire being, that no part of it does not touch the one. Then, of it and of itself, the soul has all the vision that may be. Of itself, luminous now, filled with intellectual life, become pure, light, subtle, weightless. It's become divine. It's part of the eternal that is beyond becoming. It's like a flame. If later it's weighted down again by the realm of sense, it's like a flame that's been extinguished. When the contemplative looks upon himself in the act of contemplation, he will see himself to be like its object. He feels himself to be united to himself in the way that the object is united to itself. That is to say, he will experience himself as simple just as it is simple. Actually, we should not say he will see. What he sees is not seen. It's not distinguished. It's not represented as a thing apart. The man who obtains the vision himself, as it were, becomes another being. He ceases to be himself, retains nothing of himself, is absorbed in the beyond, he's one with it, like a center coincident with another center. And while the centers co coincide, they're one. The man who saw this is identical with what he saw. Hence, he did not see it, but was rather one with it, one with it. If only he could preserve the memory of what he was while thus absorbed into the one, it possessed within himself an image of what it was. Now in that state he attained unity, nothing within him or without affecting diversity. When he had made his ascent, there was within him no disturbance, no anger, no emotion, no desire, no reason, no thought. Actually, he was no longer himself, but swept away and filled with the divine. He's still solitary at rest, not turning to the side or even towards himself. He had risen above beauty, passed beyond that choir of virtues. Such experience is hardly a vision. It's seeing of a quite a different kind. It's a self-transcendence, a simplification, a self-abandonment, a striving for union and a repose. It's an intentness upon uh, confirmation. So what, so uh, we as well transcend being by virtue of the soul with which we are united. Now if you look upon yourself in this state, you'll find yourself an image of the one. If you rise beyond yourself in an image rising to its model, uh, then you've reached the goal of your journey. When you fall from this vision, you will, by arousing the virtue that is within you and by remembering the perfection that you possess, regain your likeness and through virtue rise to the intelligence and through wisdom back to the one. Such is the life of divinity and of the divine. Blessed men 
right? Detachment from all things. It's the flight of the alone to the alone. And that's how he ends it. So I wanted to introduce you to this. So next time we can then take that issue of love and talk about how he uses the idea of romantic love and love to talk about the relationship between these two and how it best expresses how this is possible to move from one to the other as well as the soul to intelligence. That's where we're going next time. Thank you. The term agape, is, is this the love that it describes or is that <clears throat> something different? Well, uh, agape or agape and eros, um, there are quite a few people make quite a bit of difference between those two. But in the purest sense of this tradition, you can see this very clearly in Plato's symposium. Let me see if I sketch it, what he's doing. He's doing this. He's saying basically you have four stages. <clears throat> Sees the beauty, is in pursuit. This is the lover pursuing the beloved. This is loving. Um, sexual intercourse. Right. As a consequence, it goes through the next stage. And uh, and here you see she is pregnant. And here. They are, at this point, raising, nurturing, and caring for the offspring. Now, when Plato talks about the steps, pregnant, <clears throat> giving birth, giving birth, nurturing, He uses exactly the same language, exactly the same language to describe, here you can see, the soul. It sees beauty, beauty itself as it were, and wants to get in it. As you can see, you seldom have pictures of a pregnant soul, but there is one, is it not? Now, what's essential to Plato is that something must come out of it. See, something has to come to birth out of it and be raised and nurtured. Excellence. Excellence. See, that's what's raised and nurtured. So therefore, what Plato is doing is he's taking eros not Agape. He's taking arrows and showing that the same principles that function through this is really a shadow of this. Or you can put it the other way around. In other words, the same dynamic that, it, that is encountered here is also on, on the level of the soul and where we're going next week on the level of the divine. Of course, we'll have four levels when we get there. So, yes? I'm sorry, so in that sense, is soul kind of the vehicle, I mean, is 
love kind of the vehicle to which soul yeah. moves to, towards beauty? Yeah. Yeah, because it has the drive, it has the one-centeredness, it's natural, it's spontaneous, it doesn't have to be cultivated. It doesn't have to be cultivated. See, artificial koans and spiritual exercises have to be cultivated. But if the person crosses the line and experiences or gets the intuition that we're really talking about is beauty itself, to the degree to which that becomes clear to the person, you don't have to tell them to consider it. Right? To that degree, it'll be uppermost in their mind, to the very degree proportionate to the way in which they perceive it. That's what they're going to be experienced. Now, there's an, there is a... See, Christians did something with belief. Right? Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but um, Christians did two things. They took Eros and said, no, 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 this isn't right. It has to be a spiritual agape. And they also took belief, they, they took belief and opinion, and in the Greek world, the world of philosophy, the goal is to get out of the realm of belief, not to cultivate it. Like through this whole talk, there was no need for the idea of belief, so supernatural belief. Yeah. Um, what you just said, um, do I have a question I have? Oh, sure. It was um, the idea of God is as having a form as being a being like us. If what? If God has a form? Having, having a form. God doesn't have a form. Right. Not in this game. And if there is, it's not, it's not really what the, the demand of the ultimate source. Yeah, this idea of the good and the one, if you want to deify and talk about it as a God, no form, no distinction, no differences, no motion, no action, no drama, no transformation. Yeah, want to restate your point now? Or right, did that help you? That was, um, was asking. Yeah, okay. So, see what Christians do, they took the idea of belief, pistos, and they turned it into the idea of faith. They took the Greek idea of opinion, and they made that into the word glory. All right, that's a transformation of basic terms. So what the Greeks threw out, or tried to get rid of, or tried to find some way to understand and go beyond, they accepted as the condition for their new religion. In the Greek system, you're saying they tried to remove the concept of belief? Yeah. Because they're saying yeah. you can know, yeah. Or, yeah. Be, oh, yeah. or ultimately encounter the presence sure. of sure. Why, the one the good. Yeah, why have belief if you can know? Oh, it's a fundamental paradox, and uh, there's that, so much good, rich suffering behind the other. Though, no, yeah, that's right. You have suffering over here, and you have a lot of things uh, which no, don't, don't have any role here. That's why Saint Paul says, Saint Paul said to me in a very fine statement. He said, uh, "What does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? Nothing." He saw it. Right. They saw it. So did that, that help them? Yeah. yeah. So therefore the transformation of Eros to Agape stripped it from this, this similarity and distinction. Or put it another way, it created a negative view of Eros, which for the Greeks, that same dynamic appears on a spiritual plane. You're not talking about different things, one put down and one put up. But the same dynamic appears on multiple levels. It's interesting um, in some uh, uh, dialogues of it's um, Pierre Belayat Khan. He's kind of a very quite a high of um, mm -hmm. Sufi master. Uh, he's talking about the point where you learn to detach, and then he mm -hmm. ultimately says you learn to detach from detachment. Yeah, and it yeah. seems like this yeah. is kind of what they're saying here too. There was yeah. a point where oh, yeah. you said, where Plotinus is actually saying, you even let go of the chasing of that ideal, in a sense, too. You've got to go beyond knowing that you're contemplating. Right. Um, oh, you, you realize you're still contemplating? Well, you've got to work harder. 
So there's really this concept yeah. of detachment going on here too. It's yeah. Oh yeah. Very strongly. You see, on the highest level, uh, there there is a love that is detachment. With what, under what conditions, becomes the object of our search? Assuming you're still in love with forms, assuming you're still caught up in the world and not. Um, oh, which which forms? You mean Platonic forms or the physical forms? Still, um, haven't experienced the second or uh, the in between stage that you're still mm -hmm. subject to your environment. Mm -hmm. Assuming you're still in that state, is there anything? keep holding you back from the mind inside yourself if you are in the state that you're subject to your environment. Let me, let me take your question and put it in another one. See if I do justice to it. Um, you see, what's interesting about the spiritual path of the Greeks is that their central figure is Socrates. He's the personification and symbol of philosophy. And uh, according to the way in which you read Plato, he certainly sketched out all of these dynamics for the spiritual ascent to intelligence and being to the good or the one itself, which is in the Republic and the Phaedrus. But Socrates, on his last day of his life, in the jail when they fed him the poison, he asked the attendants to remove his wife and his child. She had a child from him. So he was 70 at the time. So he was doing something that wasn't removed from this. And yet, he, see, we're dealing with a kind of mysticism that doesn't deny either one of these levels, but can, can coexist. The difference is when you are devoting all of your energies to a spiritual ascent with an intense desire to achieve something, that's different than saying that has to be your whole life from beginning to end. And also Socrates had a great reputation of being a man who could drink everyone else under the table. See, he is so singularly human and remained human from the beginning and the end that the ascetic ideal and the struggle against the passions and everything else ta must take on a different, completely different complexion when we talk about Plato and the Platonic tradition. Uh, the Buddhists do that. Now, the Buddhists are into that, too. The Buddhists would say, uh, especially in Zen and meditative traditions, that if you go into a monastic system for a period of time, then you want to be very strict with yourself and confine yourself, etc., to a whole bunch of things and live a very ascetic life. But that's for an intense period of time called sashins and special periods of meditation. And then you go back to your everyday world. It's better than that. I wonder whether I have a copy of Plato. Yeah, I think I do. His description of what you encounter when you gain that vision of uh, justice itself, primary forms, uh, is quite interesting. If I can just read you just one small section of it. Um, justice is a is the practice inwardly. Huh? You must put all three parts in tune within him. Highest, lowest, middle. Exactly like the three chief notes of a scale and any other intervals between them. He must bound all these together and make himself completely one out of many. See, that's the trip to the one. Now, notice what he says as a consequence. And made himself completely one out of many, temperate and concordant, and then only do whatever he does, getting of wealth, care of the body, or even matters of state or pri private contract. See, after achieving it, then you're living your life for the everyday world. I mean, you're still part of the everyday world. Therefore, there isn't that tension between this kind of world and us. In all these, he must believe and name as just and beautiful dealing. Whatever practice preserves this condition and works along with it, 
and as wisdom he must name the knowledge which presides over this practice. Right, and then he goes on to talk about it. Right, does that help? Not quite put on is if you haven't yet experienced the higher state, yeah. or the in between state on the way to divine, if your your um, manifestations never has no um, impression of that, do you still do you still choose everything that comes into your life, or once you're caught up and subjected to you, is it, is it possible to be no. disordered, or do you always have it in you? Have it? You're, you never know how to need to come back. You see, the, the curious problem of the spiritual life is between Greek and all of the traditions. Because they didn't go into monasteries. They didn't develop a private practice of spiritual di disciplines that separated you off. They built up a set of practices while living in the everyday world. He was the figure in the agora, in the marketplace. The other tradition, a strict asceticism, is to separate yourself and sit on some quiet, desolate area and develop all kinds of psychic abilities and things of that nature. They're after different goals. They have different, ultimately, they may reach the same goal, but they have different states of mind they're trying to reach. So to answer, I think, the question behind you is, uh, in this game, understanding plays an absolute central role. Now why? If you, you can take Plotinus, what we read tonight, or any other work like Plotinus, Proclus, Plotinus, Porphyry, Plato. They want to work on one thing under one idea, and that is the preparation, the proper preparation for vision is understanding. Now, what do you do to get understanding? That you have to, gee, hmm, hmm, got to talk, have to relate, have to compare, have to look for people who know a little bit more than you do, if possible. Right. You have to have an interaction, interrelation with people, intercourse with people. That's the role of understanding. You're into the world of the mind, you're into the world of words, you're into the world of people. That's the Greek world. Coffee shops. That's this game. People. And, uh, uh, but yet in the middle of a clearly, and, but very clearly during periods of, of concentrated effort, undoubtedly they did suspend all kinds of activities for short periods of time, I'm pretty sure of that. But it wasn't a withdrawal to some monastic system. That's agape and uh, trying to get over human suffering and all of those spiritual or religious efforts. See, this is a spiritual system, not a religious system, if you want to make the difference. Religious systems has to have a dogma and has to have a very strict way of being because you're in a community. A spiritual system is trying to develop states of mind. However and wherever you develop states of mind, in the Greek world is a function of your understanding. It's cultivating understanding in words and communicating and sharing. So it's a different ball game. We're only now getting back into the play in the Hellenic world. It's been pretty much closed to our culture. So if that helped, I hope so. Keep keep going. Um sort of further. Is love as the vehicle to get back to the source? Or you said that love is what, is what triggers the driving force to mm -hmm. rebel to it. Mm -hmm. Do we all, does every set of being automatically have that within them to go back to where they came from? Or if, if even if they're not looking towards it, is it somewhere always accessible so that they, could, they would be able to go back there without something in the physical to trigger that curiosity and bring them back to that? I'm not sure. Could you say it in another way so I make sure I get your point before I open my mouth? Just say it again in another way. Same are point. You, are you created already having that love or already that, that drive to get back there? No. You see, I'm glad you said that. This, see, it's not something you have to create. See, the, 
that would mean there's something you have to cultivate that isn't readily available to you. No, no, no. Um, it's becoming sensitive to beauty. That's all, becoming sensitive to beauty. And then being drawn to the possibility that there can be something called beauty itself. Now, if you want to try it, <clears throat> read Socrates' speech from the symposium, right? Twenty, a hundred times. And I'm not joking. You see, because understanding takes practice. See, it's, it's a kind of a kind of meditation. And by going over it and over it and over it and making connections between what he's doing, right, then you'll see it as a unity. When you see it as a unity, you'll be drawn into the beauty of it. When you're drawn into the beauty of it, then you can see that the role that beauty is playing in the pursuit of understanding. And then since the thing he's talking about is beauty itself, you're being drawn in to see the beauty and the nature of beauty through understanding by a consummate artist who put it together called Plato. So, um, I would say, um, <clears throat> enjoy, you're going to have a great life. Find beauty wherever you can, see whether you can get into it, enjoy it as much as you can, develop it, appreciate it, cultivate it. That's understanding. Then try to figure out, hey, if there's beauty all around here, if I have to become... See, that's the, these words. See? Prepare for it. Prepare to receive it. Enter into it. Grasp it. Right? Touch it by a likeness to it. Let it become an object of contemplation. This is all through understanding. See, this is through all understanding. Now, within the system, do they deal with things like a shadow? The shadow concepts, or um, like the Jungian concept well, of, of shadow. It's kind of Jungian in a sense, yeah. Archetypically, I mean, do they go into the area that there is? I mean, it's not just all let's have fun. Let's just go for the. Let's just go searching for beauty. Everything is light and wonderful. Do they? Does the system deal with mm. shadow concepts? Or? See, the shadow concept is a shadow of. Just on thinking that we yeah. have, to have to or something, I don't know. Yeah, okay. But the shadow concept is the shadow of the devil. That's Carl Jung's Christianity coming through. See, and the word uh, kako in Greek uh, is a very interesting word. Um, it's often translated, simply it's bad. When people get into Plato and you get a Christian translator, he'll translate that into evil. The idea of evil means that there is some demonic force in the very heart and nature of reality which is in conflict with the good and that, that cosmic battle that is going on in the heavens and the nature of reality is also going on within us, within ourselves, and therefore we're torn between good and evil within ourselves. That's... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. This, this is, this is a different tradition. They don't have that notion in the Platonic world. Evil doesn't exist. Therefore, all of the associations with it have no place. Evil doesn't exist in the Greek world. Bad does, good and bad, but not evil. If you mean by evil, if you represent the idea of evil as in, in religious systems as a demonic force which is part of the nature of reality, an eternal struggle, which will finally will be settled at some point in the future between good and evil and a final conflagration of the world, etc., etc. You know the rest of the story? That's evil. That's not bad. See, therefore, in Christianity, you have the problem of sin. In this game, you have the problem of ignorance. If someone is doing something that you think is bad, you have to bring them to, to try to understand why it is they're doing something bad, and if they can understand the reasons why they're doing it, they can be freed from the necessity for doing it. So bad is, in a sense, ignorance. Ignorance, that's right. Because their basic assumption is that all men desire the good. There is no man that doesn't desire the good. And that that can be done and experienced. Right. So even if someone is, uh, take the worst person you can imagine, on reflection, could you not say the person is doing that because they think it's good for them? Sure. Even a masochist who's suffering as much as possible 
is doing it because he thinks he deserves being suffered and therefore it's good for him to suffer. So from the Greek world, everybody does everything for the good. The only question is you have to make it so clear to oneself that you can find a direct path to the good that you desire. And no concept of um, all life is suffering, a, a basic Buddhist tenant there? No, it, you, it, in the Platonic world it's worse than that. They can't conceive of a person in the Mino, as a perfect example of it in Plato's Mino. Socrates says to Mino, uh, and wouldn't the worst thing be to know that something is bad and still to seek it? Yeah. And then in seeking it, to gain it? Oh, yes. And to gain it, possess it? Oh, yeah. And to know that you may be injured by it? Oh, yeah. And being made injured by it, you may become miserable? Oh, yes. And to become miserable knowing it, that's what you want, is to be wretched? Oh, yes. Would anyone want to live a life of being wretched? Oh, no, they say. See, it's inconceivable that someone would knowingly knowingly, consciously, choose something that would make them wretched. But they say, oh no, no one ever do that. Therefore, they're modern in that sense, cognitive psychologists. So this is a pure journey of, from ignorance to, no. to the one. No, no, no. Without a system of guilt or all this suffering. Do they deal with the idea of how, I mean, and is there, there's a reincarnation process in this? They also have the idea of reincarnation which can be utilized to explain how some people are at different levels at different times, or maybe there are... Their game, their game is that uh, the primary goal of this world is to learn. You came with a problem. This is the arena in which you try to bring yourself to solve it. That's what you're here for. You primarily, this universe is constructed, as it were, like a school. It's a paideia. It's a place for learning. And the goal is to learn especially the kinds of things you didn't learn before. So you're carrying your past mistakes with you, which predispose you to doing certain things. Therefore, the game is, hey, why don't you figure out why you're doing those things? Maybe you can be free of them. And that's the process of dialogue and reflection and talking. Yeah. So clean. Yeah, different world. Yeah, different world. I have a really hard time with that. <laughs> which, really, which makes me a little sad for me. <laughs> see, uh, like, if uh, it would be wonderful to have, see, uh, any person who has been convicted of a crime, and we re let's say, assume that they even admit to the crime, a terrible crime, right? In the Greek world, perhaps we, one day we will get there, the goal in the courtroom would be to bring that person to try to discover what forces brought him to that place. What things did he learn in the past that predisposed him to setting himself up to do those things? So that we can learn from the worst, the worst of us what brought a person to that condition. What prepared them for doing that? How did they receive whatever it was that brought them to do what they did? How did they enter that kind of life how did they grasp the potentialities to commit all of those things that they did? To what did they want to become like? See, it works on both levels. So therefore, we would train, transform our courtrooms into learning scenes. Say, who influenced you? Your uncle, your mother, your father, your teachers, your friends? Well, let's see if we can put all of those things together to try to understand why you were influenced in such a way that you went ahead and did what you did. Oh, then we can learn. See, that's why the Greeks went to theater. Theater was the arena which they could contemplate fate working itself out through generations of families. That's why they went. They wanted to see that, that generation, that particular kinds of problems come down through generation after generation. That's uh, Oedipus, etc. Therefore, theater is learning. We could transform our courtroom into learning. And justice seems different than righteousness. The word justice in Greek is righteousness, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, Yeah, that's, that's righteousness. Our I, use of the word justice is legalistic. And I think uh, my Judeo-Christian concept of righteousness is being right and winning and having the oh, no, no, sword no. and... Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's the tyranny of righteousness. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.